Originally released in 1988, Super Mario Bros. 2 may be the black sheep of the classic NES Mario titles, but it introduces to so many iconic characters and concepts, it quickly found its way in the gamers' hearts and is still beloved to this day. The only question remains, is Super Mario Bros. 2 still worth playing? The history of Super Mario 2 is well documented. It came out originally as Yumikojo Doki Doki Panic in Japan as part of the Dream Festival, an event that was happening from a television station in Japan. The game was modified to make it into Mario to get released in the US because the original Super Mario Bros. 2 was deemed too similar and too difficult for North American audiences. So while it didn't start off as a Mario title, a lot of the same people that worked on Doki Doki Panic actually also worked on Mario 1. Super Mario Bros. 2, at its core, is an action platformer with four playable characters, seven worlds featuring multiple levels each, with the first six worlds having three levels, and the final world only having two, including the final castle and final boss. The player roster is, of course, Mario, Luigi, Toad, and Princess Peach, giving us, for the very first time, the ability to play as Toad and Peach, each of which play a little bit different and have their own attributes that end up making them better or worse for certain situations. Mario is the well-rounded character with good speed and good jump. Luigi has a much higher jump, but a little bit less as far as the speed is concerned. Toad has the absolute best speed, but absolutely the worst jump. And then of course Princess Peach, which doesn't really have that much as far as speed or jump is concerned, but the float ability gives the princess the advantage, making her one of the most popular characters to play as. And as the game begins, you'll quickly find yourself running and platforming your way through various themed worlds such as grassy plains, desert-themed areas, icy levels, and of course, a castle in the sky. One of the coolest aspects in the game is being able to pull up the plants from the ground. You'll find various vegetables, power-ups, sometimes enemies, and of course, the magic potions. These potions can then be thrown anywhere to go into the subspace parallel dimension. Here, any of the plants you pull in that dimension will actually turn into coins, which can then be used in the minigame at the end of each level, as well as sometimes you'll be able to locate mushrooms or even use warp zones if you place the potion at the right place. To me, the funnest part though about picking up the plants is being able to use them as weapons to take out enemies. And you can also jump on top of most enemies in the game and use them as weapons as well. It's still satisfying today to throw an item from way across the screen to take out a long distance enemy, or using an enemy to throw into another enemy, which then ends up comboing into more enemies taking out multiples at a time. While it definitely took a little bit to get used to as far as the health system was concerned, instead of just having the large Super Mario or Fireball versions of Mario, you actually had a health gauge. Getting those mushrooms in the subspace was able to increase your health bar temporarily, but when you make it to that next level, it's gone again. So usually it's two hits and you end up losing a life. One of the most intense and nerve-wracking moments in classic gaming has to be when you find the keys and get chased by the evil mask Fanto. He comes to life as soon as you end up picking up the key, chases you from the room to room, and of course only disappears if you throw the key, but then comes right back when you pick it back up, and of course finally goes away when you use the key to unlock doors. These moments are not only very fun and a little bit difficult, at least as far as this game is concerned, but also extremely stressful. Besides the fun gameplay, Mario 2 also introduced us to so many iconic enemies that would go on to stay in the series and are still part of Mario today. Enemies such as Birdo, the egg-spewing gatekeeper that would prevent you from making it to the next level, having to take her out before you were able to get a crystal and then move on to the next stage. There's been some mislabeling as far as the gender is concerned, but in Japan, Birdo is also known as Catherine, which I always thought was an interesting name for Birdo overall. And of course, there's a few varieties of Birdo in this game that would end up either spewing more eggs, less eggs, and sometimes only fireballs in your direction. There's also, of course, the Shy Guy enemy introduced in the very first level of the game. Shy Guys not only are extremely popular, one of my personal favorites, but also would go on to become a mainstay enemy, especially in the Yoshi Island style of games. And then there's my absolute favorite Mario enemy of all time in Sniff It. These guys had little cannons for their nose and were able to fire out projectiles and in the right situation can be quite annoying. Unfortunately, they don't get seen quite as often as some of the other enemies mentioned here, but they did have a great role as Booster's minions in Super Mario RPG. There's also, of course, the Cactus and Pokey, who was really cool that you were able to pick up each piece of Pokey and use them as individual weapons if you wanted to. You had the Magic Carpet Riding Pidgeot, so you were able to throw off the carpet and then ride across 
across large gaps and you needed to time it just right so that you were able to make it across before that magic carpet ended up going away. There was the snow flurry guys that were able to slide on ice being a little bit annoying in those right moments. And then I argue the cutest representation of a porcupine as far as gaming is concerned in Porcupo. Speaking of enemies though, then there's the awesome boss encounters, such as Mauser, the very cool sunglass wearing mouse that would throw bomb after bomb after bomb in your direction, having the time it just right to pick up the bombs or catch them in midair and then launch them back at them before they were able to explode. In fact, in the original Doki Doki Panic, there was three Mauser encounters, but we have one substituted for the enemy known as Claw Grip, the rock throwing crab that you had the time it just right to jump on top of the rocks he threw and launch them back at him. There's Tri Clyde, the fireball spewing three-headed snake, Fry Guy, the floating fire face, and of course, Wart, the final boss of the game. War is a very underrated final boss. He has a very cool concept of opening his big mouth to fire out bubbles in your direction, but then even had his own weakness in his room. The vegetables that you've been picking up throughout the course of the entire game can be grabbed through a weird organ-like pipe system in the background, where you're able then to throw him down his throat, slowly choke him to death, and then finally get to enjoy the ending to Mario 2. Super Mario Bros. 2 would go on to sell a ton of copies back in the NAS days, was featured as the very first cover game of Nintendo Power when that magazine ended up making its debut. It would get several re-releases over the year, including the awesome version as part of Super Mario Bros. All-Stars, the special done version for the Nintendo Satellaview, which was a satellite service in Japan that you were able to get for your Super Famicom that would broadcast games directly to it, and even featured live dialogue from actors that were going on. This stuff ended up being a really cool concept that we never got in North America, and this particular version of that features some really cool additions, as well as was kind of a sequel as far as the story was concerned. One of the coolest versions, though, for Mario 2 is the Game Boy Advance version, Super Mario Bros. Advanced. While a lot of the other Mario Advance titles didn't see a ton of changes made to them, Mario 2 not only had a sprucing up of the graphics, which were different from the Super Mario Bros. All-Stars version, but they also ended up featuring new boss encounters and other new elements thrown into the mix to make it feel like a really a new game overall. While nowadays it may be a little bit more difficult to start getting your hands on the classic original versions of Super Mario Bros. 2, the game has been re-released in its original form for the Nintendo Wii, Wii U, and 3DS Virtual Consoles, and I'm sure when the Switch gets Virtual Console support, it'll be on that as well. Mario 2 is one of those games that is probably in my top 10 as far as times I've played through it all the way from start to finish. I love this game, I love the enemies, the music still is absolutely fantastic and enjoyable to listen to, especially some of the great remixes of these songs that are out there, and of course, it has its rightful place as part of the Mario franchise all these years later. So, is this game still worth checking out? You're darn right. I highly recommend, of course, if somehow you've never played it, check out the original Super Mario Bros. 2. But anyway guys, it's going to wrap up this review. I'd like to thank you for watching, and of course I hope you enjoyed.